Good morning, good morning, Rabotai. Breakfast and the class today is dedicated anonym, anonymously for the success and if Shalema of Geres Beracha Bat Simcha, who is in surgery right now. May Hashem grant her and all of Am Yisrael a complete recovery. Uh, if you have the chance after the class, please say uh, a couple of pereks of Tehillim. Geres Beracha Bat Simcha. Breakfast as well is dedicated anonymously for the Refuah Shalema of Rachel Bat Nili. Refuah Shalema Bekarov. And the week of Cobra was dedicated in loving memory of Sam Yisai, Lava Shalom Lilu Nishmat Shalom and Rivka, sponsored by his son Isaac Said. The Gemara asks a very interesting question. The Gemara asks, Ma Ra'u Chanina, Chanina, Chananya, Mishael, and Azaya? Chananya, Mishael, and Azaya were uh, a group of uh, people during the time of the Navi, of the Navi Yechezkel. And at the time, um, Nebuchadnezzar was uh, running the show and he told all the people in his kingdom, this is a man who's ruling effectively at this time the entirety of the know of the civilized world. Okay? The, the uh, empire of the Babylonian empire of Bavel, of, of Nebuchadnezzar, in the precursor to the Persian empire of the story of Purim, Nebuchadnezzar is in charge of everything. He destroys the Beit HaMikdash. He builds himself an enormous uh, idol made of gold, okay? And he forces everyone to bow to this idol. So among the people that he tries to force is Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Three great tzaddikim at the time. These three great tzaddikim, they go to the Navi Yecheskel and they ask a she'elah. Today when you ask a question of a rabbi, you want to know if the spoon is milk or meat, you want to know if there's uh, this problem or that problem, lots of other problems. But you don't know, right? You don't know what the situation is with regards to the great tzaddikim, okay? Uh, that, back then, they were asking much bigger questions. They came to Yechezkel and they asked Yechezkel to ask God, if they do this public act of Kiddush Hashem, are they going to be saved? Yechezkel asks HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and God says, La. <laughs> Maybe he says it in pig line, one, I don't know what, how God communicated it, but Hashem said, no, not happening, I'm not saving you. They say, okay, okay, I hear you. My counter offer is, I'm going in anyway. They decided they were, they were going to uh, risk the death penalty of being thrown through a furnace of fire, um, they were going to do it anyway. And the Gemara asks, Ma ra'u, what did they see that made them think that this is what they, sh- that they should do? And the Gemara says in the name of Tudus Bat Romi, uh, Ben Romi, Tudus Ben Romi explained, he says that they learned from the Sephardim. Ma Sephardim, just like the frogs, in mitzvim al kiddush Hashem are not obligated in the mitzvah of sanctifying God's name. Katuv bahem, it says about them, ve'alu uba'u betanurecha, and they will get up and they will come. They will enter in tanurecha into your ovens, u'misharoteicha, and into your houses. They're going to get into your bed and into your pajamas and into. They're going to jump into your throats. Okay, the sifardeim they jumped everywhere. Okay, and at this time, Rabotai. Um, the Hananya Mishael Razaya said, if the frogs jumped into the ovens, right, and they don't have a mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem, of sanctifying themselves on God's name, risking their lives for God, how much more so us, that we do have that mitzvah, we have an obligation. Now it's important to understand, first they asked, are we going to be saved? The answer to that question was, no, you're not going to be saved. What's their response to that? The mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem is even if you're not going to be saved. Where do we learn the mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem from? It says, Right? And you will love Hashem, your God, all of your heart, what does bechol nafshecha mean? Bechol levavecha means with both of your yitzarim, yitzah tov and yitzah hara. Bechol nafshecha means with all of your soul, afilu, even if notel nafshecha, they take your soul, even still, you have to give up your life for the sake of God. Now, that's not in all mitzvot, but on certain mitzvot, the big three, idolatry, adultery, and uh, avodaz, and, um, 
and uh, uh, immorality, okay, idolatry, adultery, excuse me, and murder, those three big averot, if someone tells you they're going to kill you unless you over on the avera, you're still not allowed, you're not, you have to give up your life, al kidush Hashem. Chalanya Mishael and Azariah says, this is Abu Dazara, chalas, we're going in. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Yechezkel, P.S., I'm going to save them. But don't tell them I'm going to save them, because that way the reward that they'll get is going to be much greater. Chalanya Mishael and Azariah are crying, I don't know, they say goodbye to their families. They go in, they're not coming out. They learned this from the frogs. Nas'u kal vachomer. They go in, the rest is history. HaKadosh Baruch Hu does a miracle. Charanya, Mishael, and Azayah are saved from a furnace of fire. Rabutai, a thinking person who looks at this story, I, I can't tell you. There's so many points that have to jump out and just really grab your attention. Point number one. What kind of Kalvachomer is that? Kalvachomer means you learn if this is the case in a lower, you know, in a low, lesser degree, of course that's going to be the case in a higher degree. So as an example, let's say the halakha is you have to spend $5 for a mitzvah mid Rabbanan to achieve it. One would know that at the very least you'd have to spend $5 on a mitzvah from the Torah because that's a higher level. That's a Kalvachomer. What kind of Kalvachomer over here? Over here it says explicitly, God said to the frogs, Ve'alu uba'u, and they will go into the houses, the beds, the clothes, u'betanu and in your ovens. God gave them an explicit command to go into the oven. Where, why is there a kalvachomer to the case of Chalaniyah, Mishael, and Azariah? That's question number one that they ask. Rabotai, the answer is, and the answer, this answer is brought, and I think that this answer shakes, shakes me to my very core, is that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azaya understood that while no frog individually had been commanded to go into the Tanurecha, into the, into the furnaces, and every frog could have said, I'm going to be the one that goes in the house. <laughs> I'm going to be the one that goes in the private jet. I'm going to be the frog that goes in his clothes, in his pocket. I'm gonna be the frog that goes in his toilet. You be the frog that goes in, his, in the furnace. Yes, Hashem commanded, but every single frog had an excuse. Oh, I thought the other guy. No, I thought Froggy McFrog was gonna go. Kermit, I'm me, I'm now I'm a star. You know, millions of children are waiting for me. I can't go be burned to a crisp. Right, what is this, what are we, French? Yeah, Rabotai, we learn from here the unbelievable uh, reality and truth of the fact that in life there are two different types of people. And if you're not one, you're the other. And if you're not the one, the other, you're the one. There are people who no matter what in life, they are always making excuses. And there are people in life who never look for excuses. Chananya, Mishael, and Azayah saw that there were frogs that chose to be the ones to prove the point. There were frogs that risked their lives and they understood that it took the misirut nefesh to be able to bring about this, to bring about this miracle, this kiddush Hashem. And they said if a lowly animal could do this, if his instinct for survival told him that this is what he should do, they understood that at the very least there's no olam haba for frogs, Rabotai. Even if Peter complains about it, the ethical treatment of animals, even if, uh, you know, uh, all these organizations go majnun, even if you have a liberal left, you know, complaining about the fact that it's not fair to animals, that they don't have olam haba, there's no olam haba for animals. And yet the frogs jumped in because they understood that with or without a reason, with or without a, an, an excuse, I have to decide what the right thing to do is. And yes, I might have a way of squirming out of the agreement and saying that, oh, the, by the frogs, they were commanded. But they understood that the right, the ones that were being given, uh, that took the chance to be Mekadesh Shem Shamayim, those were the ones ultimately that their instinct for survival told them that this is what they should do.
This was the right thing to do. Otherwise, it would have been impossible. Rabotai, this is something that Jews throughout the ages have had within them. And it's a paradox. Because one would assume that the only people who are capable of giving up their life, of risking life and limb for Judaism, are people who are religious. Why? Because to them, religion is important. However, if you are a student of history, you will know that that's not accurate. You had Jews that refused to denounce their Jewish citizenship, that refused to denounce their Jewish identity. Even during the times of the Greeks and the Romans, people that were not so religious and other things, they had it within them to be able to, to say, I'm not making an excuse, this is who I am, you want to kill me for who I am? Fada. Rabotai, there are two types of people. The people who always have an excuse, and they always will. There'll always be a reason why it wasn't their fault. There'll always be a reason why the buck didn't stop with them. There'll always be a reason why they're not as uh, careful as they should be, because in school they had a rabbi that turned them off. And, you know, when they were young at home, and, you know, this. Everyone's got a thousand reasons. But ultimately, Rabotai, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azayah learn from the frogs that chose to not have an excuse. And the amazing thing is that even though God said, I'm not saving them, why did God say that? If actually when they went in, God did save them. Is God a liar? You know what the answer is? There's a historical precedent for the furnace of fire trick. Who is it? Abraham. Abraham gets saved because he says, burn me, I'm out. I'm not with the Avodah Zarah team. I'm with God's team. What happens 10 seconds after Abraham gets out? They ask Haran, okay, Halanu Are you with us? Are you with Abraham? Or are you with the us? Are you on God's side or on Abodah Zarah's side? Haran says, God's side. Haran jumps in the fire. Haran, he gets burnt alive. Why? Why is Haran a crispy critter, Abutai? Why is Haran well done? The answer is because Abraham jumped into a fire not to be saved, but to do the right thing. Haran jumped into a fire to be saved. You jumped into a situation so that God should save you? That's not Misirut Nefesh. It was the Misirut Nefesh of Abraham that saved him. It was only because Hananiah, Mishael, and Azad jumped in thinking that they were not going to be saved. The Afal Piken, that's what saved them. Rabotai, I think that some people think that um, they and their friends are the same people. Because you're sitting next to a guy in shul, and you think, I'm praying, he's praying. You think, I send my kids to a Jewish school, he sends his kids to a Jewish school. I keep kosher, he keeps, same, same. Rabotai, it's not like that. Some people are keeping things when it works for them. And it happens to be that it worked for them. And it worked for them their whole life. And for you, it didn't work. And you couldn't afford it. And you had a bunch of reasons. But you stuck with it anyway. The, the, the reason why God saved me, Sha'il Qaranyana, Azariah, when they went in is because they were not the same people that God was talking about when He said, I'm not saving them. The people who God was talking about were not Moser Nefesh people. They were non moser Nefesh people. Moser Nefesh people attain for themselves a completely different interaction with God. <coughs> with one caveat, that they're not doing it for that interaction. Because that alone undermines the very act of Misirut Nefesh. Rabotai, Rav Avram Simcha Kuk was once sitting in his house. And as he's sitting there in his house, he sees this beautiful bird fly into the home. I don't know if it was a parrot of beautiful colors, green and red and orange and yellow, beautiful uh, tuki, they would call it in Hebrew. The literal translation is a parrot, but from what I'm led to believe, that word in Hebrew actually means any brightly colored bird, okay? He looks at this bird, he's admiring it. Wow, it's very beautiful. So he comes over to pick up this bird, maybe to set it free. The bird is terrified. He sees this man walking towards him, right? The bird jumps up, flies right at the window. Bam! Boom. Hazit, the rabbi, stops. Again, he leans forward to help the bird out. The bird flies up, boom, into the window. Again, follow the Lord. Hazit, this third time the rabbi comes to the bird again, three times. The bird 
smashes into this glass window, falls to the floor. The rabbi can't get close. So he says, you know what, instead of saving the bird, I'll open the window. So he walks away from the bird, so the bird is not frightened, and you know, quietly leans up, you know, walks against the wall until finally opens the window. Again, he comes close to the bird. The bird, with whatever strength that he has left, picks up his wings, right, <laughs> half dead by now, flies at the window, and flies to his freedom. Rav Ram Simcha Kuk said to his students, I was thinking to myself, what did the bird think when it flew out the window? He thought to himself for sure, the first time I flew at that window, Shema Yisrael, I slammed it to it, but I weakened it. The second time, <laughs> you know, I hit it again, you know, wow, it took a toll out of me, but you know, if you think, I, you should have seen the other guy, right? The third time, chalas, after four times, I don't know if it like broke or if it ran away, but Shema Yisrael, that thing was, you know, the bird thinks that he's scared the window away. He succeeded because he flew in the first three times. Rabbi Tai, oftentimes when we make hishtadlut in life, when we do our very best efforts, so we think that as we try and try and try, the reason why we got there in the end is because we tried three times before. And now on the fourth turn, we got it. But actually, if the rabbi didn't open the window, if God didn't open the window, open the gates, the Sha'ari Shamaim, no matter how many times you would have flown it, you'd have died before you got through. Double pane the uh, Anderson windows. You ain't never getting through Tuki. Khalas. Your story ends here, right? <laughs> if not for the fact that someone opened the window. So really, it sounds like the bird is mistaken, correct? The bird's a dib. The bird doesn't know. He's a Tuki. He doesn't know. But Rabotai. The rabbi stroking his beard, he says to his students, but in truth, is it not the hishtadlut of the bird that actually got him through the window? If he didn't fly at the window three times, boom, 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 would my mercy have been uh, instigated? Would my feelings, uh, I felt bad for the, would that have been aroused to be able to open the window to let it out? So on some level, the hishtadlut that we do actually causes these things to happen. The misirut nefesh that we do causes God to look down and say, you know what, this guy's not making excuses. This guy's not letting things stand in his way. Let me remove things from his way. There was once a rabbi who said, there's, if there's ever a yeshiva that has an easy time raising funds, there's something wrong with that yeshiva. Why? He says, because how could it be that the Yetzir Hara would allow a place that's educating in Torah, that's raising the next generation, how could it be the Yetzir Hara would let it go through? That's poison for him. He, you know, it's like a terrorist camp that, you know, that's going to operate against him. If he can, he'll try everything he can to blow it up. In life, the more we see hardships coming, when we know we're doing the right thing, the more hardship there are, the more hardships there are, the more we know that we're on the right path. And that all it takes is a little bit more misirut nefesh. All it takes is the ability to not make an excuse, to try harder one more time. And then Be'ezrat Hashem, suddenly the windows will open, the gates will open in front of us, the, uh, the fires will be cooled, the shiduchim will come, the jobs will appear, the uh, rifu'ah will make, it will make its, its way. Uh, ultimately, our hishtadlut awakens in God the mercy that was awoken in Rav Kuk. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Chalani.